Now let's move on. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar for today. And the topic is about optimization of biometric, um, sorry, biomimetic based um, aircraft wing. Okay, and it will be presented by Dr. Mahadi Masud, and he is one of our um, esteemed lecturers at EIT, and he will be um, telling us more about himself later on. And um, please note that this webinar is recorded, so we will have a video recording and uh, a, cop a, a copy of the slides that we use here, and we will be sending it out to you guys through your email in a couple of days or two, two business days from now, and it's Thursday, so most likely you will be receiving a copy of the slides and a video recording by Monday. And we also have um, a certificate of attendance that we will give out. It's for free, but you need to request for it because if you don't make the request, you won't be receiving um, the certificate. So it's very important that when I share the link or the QR code later on by the end of the webinar, please make sure to um, request for the certificate and usually our um, cutoff for um, accepting requests will be by um, Sunday evening but the earlier the better okay and we will be sending out the certificates within two to four um, business days from now All right, and I'd like to um, tell you more about EIT, just um, a quick glimpse about our school. And um, I'd like to um, proudly say that we are um, dedicated to ensuring that you as our um, students or future students will receive a world-class education and will gain skills that you can immediately implement in the workforce. and. Um, we are also one of the few engineering um, institutes in the world, and we specialize um, in engineering only, so we don't have other courses. For example, if you're looking for an architecture course, we don't have that. We only um, focus on engineering. That's why we are regarded as a specialist in the field, and we deliver a variety of courses. We have our professional certificate courses, our diplomas, advanced diplomas, undergraduate and graduate certificates, bachelor's and master's degree programs, and a doctorate of engineering as well. And uh, we have industry-oriented programs. So our programs are designed by industry experts, and that is to ensure that our students would graduate with cutting-edge skills that will be valued by employers in the workforce. And of course, our program content um, remains current with the rapidly changing technology and industry developments as well. And um, we also have world-class Australia accredited um, education. So our courses are approved and accredited by the Australian government. And aside from that, we also have um, some courses that are recognized under three international engineering accords by Engineers Australia. And those are the Sydney Accord, the Washington Accord, and the Dublin Accord. And of course, just like Dr. Mahadi here, we have industry experience lecturers. So they are highly experienced engineers and subject matter specialists. And they have, of course, an ample amount of applied knowledge that they can share to our students and also on the technologies that, um, that EIT um, employs for both online and on campus. Um, it enables us to source our lecturers from a large global pool of expertise. And we are also proud of our unique delivery model. So our programs are delivered via a unique delivery methodology that makes use of live and interactive webinars, just like what we have now. And of course, 
we have our international pool of expert lecturers and we are also um, proud that we have our pool of dedicated learning support officers so they are that's one thing that that makes EIT unique because they are assigned or dedicated um, to make sure that the student's journey is um, worthwhile here at EIT and whatever um, the student's concern is regarding his stay or his study at EIT those are the go-to persons of the students and we also have our state-of-the-art um, hands-on workshops, remote laboratories, and simulation software as well, that even if you are taking an online course at EIT, you will have an experience that is um, very close to um, the real world. So that's all about our school or about EIT, and I hope that um, you will be enticed to continue learning more about EIT and explore our courses. And now I will give the floor to Dr. Mahadi. He is our presenter or lecturer for today. So um, Dr. Mahadi, you can go ahead and start your session. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks for the introduction. So hello, everyone. Uh, I know uh, there are a lot of people joining from uh, different corner of the world. Uh, uh, so this is Dr. Mahadi. And uh, I'll be talking about the talking about two software basically today, which uh, uh, one of my master's student from EIT, who used it, uh, used both of the software for his uh, uh, completion of degree. Uh, he basically finished the degree last year. Uh, I, I had actually three three students last year. One of them is uh, present in the webinar. Was in uh, was in on online mode. Uh, he finished his degree from uh, Nigeria, and two of them were from uh, Melbourne. So luckily, all three of them get uh, like higher distinction uh, in the thesis. So basically, they did their uh, final year thesis using two software. One is uh, Ansys Fluent, and another is uh, one of the optimization software. Not that very powerful, but uh, at the beginning level or at the uh, uh beginning le level of uh, optimization this is one of the most uh, commonly used response surface method optimization software which is minitab minitab so i'll be talking about both of them so uh before getting to the uh, topic so let me introduce myself so i am working as a working as a lecturer at eit so i finished my uh, phd from rmit university melbourne and uh, uh, before starting my uh, PhD. Uh, I am basically from Bangladesh, uh, one of the Asian countries. So uh, I am basically from Bangladesh, one of the Asian countries. So I, uh, after finishing my undergraduate and masters uh, back here in Bangladesh, uh, I was uh, appointed as a lecturer here, and uh, I worked my whole life like as a researcher as well, and I published uh, four uh, book, whole book three with Spinger and one with Elsevier and two of my more book will be published very soon like uh, within 2025 both of them in uh, Elsevier and both of them will be on the topic of biomimetics and after finishing my PhD I joined as a lecturer in EIT and I'm still working as a lecturer in EIT so okay so without wasting any more time let's jump into the topic so as Liz already mentioned, and I, I also already mentioned, uh, I'll be talking about the optimization of a, a biomimetic based airfoil. So there will be some content of uh, my today's uh, discussion. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, one, I, I, I'll be sharing the ISBN. And even if you go to my profile, you'll, you'll find everything in DSRSGET and uh, Google Scholar. So I'll take, uh, with due respect to everyone, I'll take all the questions, uh, hopefully after after the session, after after finishing the session, then I'll take all the questions and I'll answer to all, all the questions. Uh, so basically, I'll be talking about the uh, what will be the problem statement and how did we solve the problem or, and uh, what uh, positive outcome we get uh, from the thesis uh, after implementing both of the software 
and after analyzing everything so as i just mentioned so we'll be talking about the biomimetics so biomimetics always help positively with everything uh, like uh, biomimetics is if if we uh, if we talk about biomimetics, like what, how biomimetics can help. So nature inspired thing can be implemented in any engineering application. And whenever nature inspired thing is implemented in any of the engineering application, this is known as biomimetic. So there are a lot of examples uh, which engineer uh, used to take help from uh in their specific field as i am a mechanical engineer and aerospace is really close aerospace or aviation or aircraft is really close to my field in mechanical engineering field so we we implement biomimetics for uh the performance improvement of a airfoil and if you see if you see the figure uh we took we took help from the hydrodynamics of a humpback whale so if you look into the wing of the humpback whale, so we can see there are some sinusoidal leading edge. There are some sinusoidal leading edge over there. I just mark it. So, but the sinusoidal leading edge, there are always some question. If we want to implement the sinusoidal leading edge in a aircraft wing, what will be the wavelength and what will be the amplitude? There is no answer for such questions. So researchers are working on that. They are implementing the sinusoidal leading as on the aircraft wing, uh, specifically on the unmanned aerial vehicle. So I marked it here. There are different kind of aerial vehicle. If we go from the bottom one to top one, we can start from the NABs, the nano aerial vehicle. Then there are micro aerial vehicle. Then there are Cessna. Then there are large scale aerial vehicle, which are uh, which are known as Airbus and, and Boeing. So how can we differ them one by one? So the difference is lies in one of them, one of the most commonly used dimensionless number in mechanical engineering, which is Reynolds number. So most of the most of the aerial vehicle, which is considered as micro or nano is runs. Uh, they run in a Reynolds number ranging uh, lower than 10 to the power 5. But whenever we are talking about the Boeing or Airbus, which is the actual aerial aerial vehicle, which we used for passengers. So those are the aerial vehicles that runs like uh, at a Reynolds number of 10 to the power 7, uh, which is quite higher. So uh, in our system for this, this particular topic, which I'm going to talk about, we will talk about a Reynolds number in the range of 10 to the power 5, not too high and not too low, in a moderate range. And uh, about the mimicking, we mimic the, although we mimic a, a marine animal, but there are quite a few literature, they are working on that, but there is still issue about the optimization of the optimization of the amplitude and wavelength of the sinusoidal leading edge that uh, the humpback whale used to have if you go to the previous picture you, you can see there are the there are the sinusoidal leading edge but how many sinusoidal leading edge we should use for our aerial vehicle and what will be the amplitude what will be the uh, wavelength there is no answer for those questions so here we are to answer those questions <laughs> So uh, I already talked about the motiv uh, motivation. Uh, uh, so I am not going to talk uh, about it anymore. So there are some literature reviews. So if you look into the literature, it starts from 20, uh, 2004 and it's a bit of discrete. Uh, but still, if you look, look into it. So there are some literature uh, which we can see from 2004. And also there are some literature from uh, uh, 2021 so there are quite a few literature which we can see and after seeing that look all the modification was done on the leading edge protuberances which we are calling as sinusoidal leading edge and all of them are implemented in different type of airfoils airfoil section 
and some of them they have done only experimental analysis and some of them they have done only the numerical analysis which is like ansys or open form or there are some more other softwares by which you can do the simulation and i just talk about the reynolds number as well so there are a different sort of reynolds number but most of them if you look into them all of them are in the range of 10 to the power 5 therefore we also selected 10 to the power 5 for our analysis and if you look into their result just look into the first result so uh, there is a very basic term there is a very basic term in aerodynamics which is stall angle so let me explain the stall angle a little bit so if we draw a graph like this and if we put the angle here angle of attack and if we put the lift coefficient which is one of the most uh, uh, most commonly used performance parameter for aerodynamic performance parameter so normally the thumb rule is if you increase the angle of attack the lift coefficient will increase but after a certain angle the lift coefficient will decrease so you will find something like that so there will be a certain angle where the lift coefficient will be decreased but we want our lift coefficient to be increased as much as possible up to a very high angle of attack but uh, if you look into this literature you can see for a baseline aerofoil without any modification or without implementing any biomimetics the uh, stall angle this angle was only 11.7 degree but after modification they have found it that the modified aerofoil has a stall angle of 16.3 degree so that's how they have improved the performance even if you used it in terms of per sentence at a certain angle of attack 16.3 degree angle of attack they have improved the performance by 32 percent so they this is a summary but we just want to see that after optimization all of them are done without optimization they just implement the sinusoidal leading edge and they are getting good results but they they didn't optimize anything so in this research what i'll going to present today i will show after optimization how the performance is improved uh, and uh, basically i took one of the example from this literature the malipedi at all and they have improved the performance by 45 percent at 16 degree angle of attack so i took i took this example that at 16 degree angle of attack at 16 degree angle of attack how much performance could be improved for the optimized wing compared to the wing that they have they have modified so let's have a look how i did that and how how much i get so these are the questions that uh, how does the varying size and shape of the leading as protuberances on a biomimetic aerofoil impact the performance and what will be the optimal optimal size of the LEPs, the leading as protuberances and how does the presence of leading as protuberances help us to influence the stall angle i already explained what is the stall angle so these are the questions and we are expecting to we are expecting to get something better at 16 degree angle of attack which they have already get 45 percent compared to the baseline without any modification whatever they have found and after modification they have already improved 45 percent so we want to see will you be able to get anything better than 45 percent or not let's see how much we get by using the two software so these are the objective which is really connected with the uh, research question i'm not going to discuss them again so this is my methodology at the beginning uh, at the beginning we did select the model that which naka aerofile we will going to use so as as i as i just said we basically use this one the maliped d at all so we use the same naka model naka 2412 if you can look into here naka 2412 we use this model i am not going deeper like what does that 2412 mean? every digit have the, have its significance uh, when uh, when we do the degree we, uh, with eit uh, we used to explain everything like what does 2 mean what does 4 mean what does that 12 mean and what does that naka mean 
and if anything changes how the performance also changes so we select that naka 2412 so after selecting that uh, we design it in solid work so we design it in solid work then we run the simulation in ansys fluent and we did the optimization in minitab these are the three software that we use and in uh, eit we used to explain all the software in details basically we we didn't have any optimization course earlier but recently i did talk with our uh, course coordinator milind we already develop one new course regarding the optimization and optimization is a uh, is a course which you can use in any engineering field anywhere so we already developed that course and we're going to uh, teach the uh, not mini tab not specifically mini tab we will teach the basic theory of optimization and related software it could be mode frontier it could be mini tab or anything and uh, this is the method of analysis we'll uh, we'll do the cfd simulation by using ansys fluent and we will do the validation yes our result is correct or not because uh, we are still like uh, we don't have the wind tunnel with us because the wind tunnel is quite big and it needs like in in every university we don't have the wind tunnel so what we did for the experimental validation we used to validate our result with the published wind tunnel exper experimental result so we will do the simulation in the same scenario with the same boundary condition that is already published for an experimental result if you see the table if i go back to that table again you can see the left column here here uh, so it is uh, like a lot of experimental result over there so if we do that if we do the simulation the numerical one here the study type numerical one and if you get the similar result like the experimental one then we can we can believe that yes our simulation result is correct so that's what the validation mean so we did our uh, numerical result we get our numerical result from the cfd simulation ansys fluent then we validate our result with the experimental one and finally for optimization you use the minute of software and our target was to increase the cl which is coefficient of lift our target was uh, target was to decrease the cd which was coefficient of drag and finally uh, our target was to increase the stall okay so let me let me go back here one more time so i am i was talking about this table so i already marked it so this is the study type the experimental and numerical so this is the experimental result which is already already published in the literature and not in every experimental published result hello can you hear me yes we can okay so yeah well, one one of the person okay thank you thank you so much for confirming so in not in every experimental result uh they didn't mention the numerical they didn't do the numerical analysis in some of them they have done both so i was i was pointing out on this study type so this is the numerical and experimental one okay let's jump into our next step so uh, that's how we that's how we organize our methodology and we did the uh, we did the analysis with the expected outcome of increased cl and decreased cd okay and this is the domain which is one of the most which is one of the most important part of any simulation so if you go to any book in any of the cfd book in computational fluid dynamics book you will not going to find anything about the domain selection that what will be our domain so there is basically two types of flow internal and external for a airfoil simulation we this is a external flow and in case of external flow domain is one of the most important topic because uh, like when the airplane will fly the domain is the world but in our simulation if we do a very big domain and if we don't have a good computer then we will not be able to run the simulation uh, in my phd 
in my phd when i used to run the simulation i did my phd with a penguin wing uh, if we if you go back to you know, my previous lecture in my last webinar which we did uh, most probably on november or somewhere like that i did talk about that so what what uh, what happens so i did a, i did run a simulation for 2 second and for running that 2 second simulation for getting the real world experience it takes me 3 days to run the whole simulation because the geometry was quite tricky so therefore you have to know how to play with the domain so this is uh, one of the issue that you have to play with the domain so what we did with the domain one of the thumbs rule for 2d simulate for 2d simulation oh, sorry for 3d simulation and for external flow look at that so this is the leading edge that point let me take the red color so this is the leading s and that point is the trailing s so from trailing s to that 15 c this portion is known as the downstream so the basic thumb rule is if you, if you have a good computer you can take it you can take the distance as 20 c the downstream because my, the, my student who use this one we don't have too much time because the master's thesis in eit we did in six months we don't have like phd time like three and three and a half year we can't spend too much time so therefore i ask him to do it for 15 c but if you have a good computer and if you are doing your phd or very higher study that you are doing your thesis for two years and if you have enough time then i would suggest to do it for 20 c the distance make it as bigger as possible why because the air flow the flow will give from this portion this is our inlet and uh, if you look into this picture this is our inlet and this is our outlet and in the inlet side there is no disturbance un until it hits the aerofoil when it hits the aerofoil the, the disturbance will be in this portion on the downstream portion so therefore compared to the upstream portion the downstream portion should be bigger this is the thumb rule but what will be the distance there is no clarification on that but what we did we do 10 c on the uh, upstream this is the upstream and 20 c on the downstream and 10 c on this distance and 10 c on this distance so this is one of the thumb rule that we will explain more when you will do the course we have a cfd course in eit when you will do the course we will explain it more in detail because for the domain we take like one one hour lecture but for the whole system we are explaining 12 lecture in one lecture today so obviously you can understand that we don't have enough time so that's how the domain should be selected and the question is what is c the now the question is what is c c is the chord length now if i draw a arrow file like this so this is the arrow file chord this is the arrow file chord i just draw a 2d arrow file and this is the arrow file chord so aerofoil chord so we design it based on the aerofoil based on the aerofoil we, we we don't design in like just give a distance of 150 millimeter or something like that no we don't do that we do it with respect to our geometry our geometry in this specific case is aerofoil so we do the design with respect to our geometry so that's how the domain should be selected and the domain would be different for different cases but the thumb rule is whatever i explained just now 10c upstream 20c downstream and 20 from the top surface and 20 uh, sorry 10 from the top surface and 10 from the bottom surface that's how the domain should be and one more interesting thing that you can see here although the bigger domain which is the outside domain inside the bigger domain we make two more domain just to save the computational time and computational cost and how it will look like when you'll see the mesh picture we'll understand more just to see here from here you see this is the number one this is the number two and this is the number three we make three domains the number one this is the number two and this is the number three we make three domain and close to that geometry this is the domain the number three domain this is the most important domain and we want the most finer mesh in this domain and when you go back from the finer mesh to the outer domain number one we don't need that finer mesh we just need a coarse mesh away from our geometry and for this particular case the geometry 
the geometry is the arrow file all right so yeah so if you can recall i was talking about the malipeddi paper if you can recall let's me let me go back to that uh, paper again yeah this arrow, uh, this arrow marked this is the malipeddi paper in their paper they have randomly designed four arrow foil with sinusoidal leading edge they took the biomimetic inspiration from nature and they randomly designed they didn't do any optimization so these randomly designed arrow foils are here you can see the sinusoidal leading is leading edge is over there so they have used the sinusoidal leading edge over there so there is four randomly designed we have named them 4a 2a 2b and 4b so we just designed them first in solid works and those randomly designed arrow foils were based on the wavelength and amplitude so these two are the things wavelength and amplitude based on what we have designed the arrow foil so after that and we have designed arrow foil in solid works and let's have a look uh, i just explain about three domain that we use three domain so this is our domain number 1 this is our domain number 2 and this is our domain number 3 our arrow foil is over there our arrow foil is over there so and close to that arrow foil is our area of interest so here we make the most finer mesh and when we are going away from that finer mesh a bit farther from the arrow foil it's a bit less finer and very close to that outside domain it is very coarse mesh because this is not our area of interest whatever we are talking about our area of interest is our arrow foil so we want a finer domain close to that so this is the trick that you need to learn that how to make finer mesh close to your arrow foil surface so that's what we did uh, we make three domain and we use the body of influence feature the body of influence feature close to that uh, area of interest and another thing that you always need because let me explain very quickly uh, normally in the real world how things works so uh, how things things are working in the real world like when you do a simulation when you do a simulation there are different kind of model k epsilon k omega and there are different kind of model just just give me a while let me actually let me show one thing one thing just give me a while sorry uh let me let me show you, show you one thing yeah so can you see my screen please give me a thumbs up okay okay all good so this is this is actually not part of the part of the presentation today but for presenting or explaining the presentation i need this uh, i just took it from one of the eit lectures of cfd course uh, the advanced fluid dynamics course just let's have a look into this slide so there are different model that you use when you run the simulation so it starts from rans then unsteady rans then that hybrid rans then ls then dns so these are from low power to high power and if you look into this the computational cost or degrees of freedom increases when you go from the green to uh, green to blue in dns model it takes the most of the time but mostly we use rans or unsteady rans model for the student version of uh, simulation or for the thesis for the students but when you do a phd you have to run the les or des or sas and for different model i just talk about rans even in the rans if you go there even in the rans if you go there they are a different model like k epsilon and k omega and even in k epsilon if you see that if you see that inside a k epsilon there are different kind of near wall treatment and for the near wall treatment we need a specific value of y plus value now the question is what is y plus it will take me a lot of time to explain y plus 
there is a slide over there and if you just google the y plus i just take a screenshot from google so that's how the y plus should be calculated and there are some website as well uh, i put the equation like how to calculate the uh, y plus for uh, for a specific system like i have a specific velocity that the aerofile will move at 30 meter per second and the aerofile have a chord length of one meter, then what should be the Y plus value and what should be the Reynolds number? That's what you can calculate from this specific link. And if you are planning to use a specific model of K omega, your Y plus should be one. If it is not one, you will not, you will never gonna get a correct result. Your, for a K omega model, you have to use a Y plus value of one. And, and this is the thing so if i go back to the slide again sorry just give me a while we were there so just have a look into it so you can see we use a k omega model and a rams model and for that we used we we have to have a y plus value of one and for a while for y plus value of one we use a first layer of thickness of 3.9 into 10 to the power minus 3 that was calculated from a website y plus calculator there is a website known as y plus calculator we calculate it from uh, over there and we have a y plus value of one how should you believe that we found a y plus value of one so for believing you let's have a look uh, we had a fluid velocity of 65 and a reynolds number in the range of 10 to the power 5 and the chord length of 0 0.1 meter so these things are here we have a fluid velocity and reynolds number of 65 and 10 to the power 5 uh, to, uh, in the range of 10 to the power 5 and we have a length of 0 0.1 meter so if these are the information based on this information so you can see that you can see that the y plus value let me come back to that slide a bit later just let me show you this one so look at that y plus value we took four line over the aerofoil over the aerofoil if uh, if that is a 2d uh, 3d aerofoil let's say let's say this is a 3d aerofoil sorry for my bad drawing we took four line one from here one from here one from here and one from here we took four line and over the four line those four lines is known as isosurface from the top and bottom and over the four line, we draw the Y plus value. And we found that in no, in none of the places, is just only in some places here at the top, here just a little bit, except on these places, everywhere the Y plus is less than one. So that's how you can ensure that, yes, my Y plus is one when you do a simulation uh, for your research or even uh, for your company. And if you say your boss that, yes, I use the K Omega model or K Epsilon model or DS model or SAS model with some sort of uh, kind of implementation or modification. And if you if you don't know what was your Y plus, they will never gonna believe on your uh, simulation results. So that is the case you have to show that this is my Y plus. So you can either show the Y plus in a line but I did it here, or you can show in a contour plot, which is also appreciable, up to you, uh, in which way you want to show. So that is about Y plus, and also when you do a simulation, or if you generate a mesh, what we did here, look, look, into, uh, look into that, we, we generate a mesh, but there should have some quality of the mesh, and the two most important quality for the mesh metric are the skewness and orthogonal quality. The skewness shouldn't be more than 0.95. It is, if it is over 0.95, then it is not acceptable. And the orthogonal quality is, uh, should be close to, if you look into our simulation, 
we did different we did generate different number of element and we found that skewness is 0.92 which is way less than 0.95 because our geometry was critical if you do it a 2d simulation you will get a skewness of 0.7 and we can get those skewness value from the mesh metric of our ansys fluent software and the orthogonal quality you will get the orthogonal quality also from the mesh metric from your uh, ANSYS Fluent software and which we get a uh, 0.997, which is close to one. So both of them are acceptable. So we talk about Y plus, we talk about mesh quality. The last thing about mesh is the mesh sensitivity analysis. Let's say we generate a mesh and it has a number of element of uh, 1.4 million and you get a good result. And after that, after that you found it that uh, if you increase the number of element how your result varies if your result varies after increasing your element that means your mesh is still sensitive so if you look into this uh, column we are increasing our mesh from 1.5 million to 1.6 million 1.5 million is this one this one is 1.6 million we are keep increasing our mesh but the result doesn't change so there is no point of doing simulation with this number of element so you always have to select you always have to do the mesh sensitivity analysis and select the least number of mesh after which the result will not change what we have found here in that case is 1.5 million this one 1.5 million is the point after which if we change if we increase the number of element the result doesn't change the result of uh, coefficient of lift doesn't change at zero degree angle of attack so that's how you need to do for your uh, mesh sensitivity analysis y plus value and also the uh, and uh, also the mesh quality so when we are done with that then we did the validation we did the validation against the ex, against the published result if you see there is a little bit of uh, variation uh, in result between the published one and the one that we get the variation is just because the published one as i just said this one is uh, done for one of the master's thesis and for master's thesis in eit we don't have enough time we only have six months and we can't play like a phd thesis and for the Malipeddi paper, it was from a PhD thesis. So they did it in three and a half years and we did it in six months. So, uh, so what we did, so what we did, we used RAMS model, but if you use the DNS model or LES model, you will get more accurate result close to the experimental one. So although there is a little bit of variation, if you see, although there is a little bit of variation after six degree angle of attack from here to here, the variation is a little bit but still it is acceptable uh, because we are using a rams model so we know rams model can't predict the result as accurate as the dns or LES model and uh, when you are done with this uh, when you are done with this then then we then we run the simulation then we run the simulation for the four cases that malipeddi have produced so they have produced the four cases and we have run the same simulation and we get the similar trend but just have a look compared to the baseline aerofoil baseline means there is no modification which is the green one the 4b the 4b is producing the best result the coefficient of lift the 4b has uh, more higher result uh, i think another five seven minute I, I'll be done in another five, seven minutes and then I'll take questions. Then uh, Lisa will finish the session. Thank you, Lee. OK, Thank so, you. Wh okay. So, wh so when we are done with the validation, when we are done with the validation, then we are confident about our simulation case. Yes, our simulation is producing better result. Our simulation is producing good result. So then then uh, we we jump into the optimization software. So for optimization software, there are a lot of stuff. We don't have enough time to explain everything. So we use the we use the minute of the response surface method optimization. And for that, we use the design type CCD, central composite design. 
so there are the settings i can't explain them now so for optimization you have to give a lower number firstly you have to select which things you want to optimize so we want to optimize the wavelength and amplitude here are them wavelength and amplitude and you have to give a lower range and upper range for these two so we give a lower range and upper range by taking help from the literature this could be the lower range and upper range and from that lower range and upper range the software will generate 13 set of wavelength and 13 set of amplitude for you so they have generated 13 set of wavelength and 13 set of amplitude for me uh, for us then we have created all the 13 geometry again using solid work so when we use the use the software and generate the geometry we run the simulation again and we get we get the cl value the lift coefficient value for those 13 case and when we get the 13 case of cl value and from by using those 13 case look into this contour plot then we again give the result to the optimization software for those 13 case then they have optimized the amplitude and wavelength for our system that they have said that the maximum cl value should be over 1.16 and it will be here it will be here the maximum cl value the dark green and the wavelength should be 0 0.5 and the amplitude should be less between 0 0.035 and 0 0.040 so we select this and generate the optimized doing after that we generate the optimized doing and we are expecting to get a get a cl value for this optimized condition which is again mentioned here look at that the 0 0.50 and 0 0.0370 for wavelength 0 0.50 and amplitude 0.0370 the y the y means the cl value should be minimum 1.17 or over it according to the optimization software so let's see how much we get how much we get so just have a look so this is the case for optimized one this is the case for optimized one the malipeddi paper whatever they have found they have found 1.14 which is way better than the baseline 45 percent better if you can recall the table one that i mentioned earlier and we get we jump into 1.20 from 1.14 before malipeddi did 1.14 with the randomly designed and for our simulation we get 1.20 now if you if you look into look into the cl by cd we want a higher cl but we want a lower cd so if you look into look in terms of cl by cd we still get better results like 5.71 for a baseline without any modification it was 3.68 and after modification after optimization malipeddi before optimization malipeddi got 4.95 but for our optimized case we got 5.71 which is way better than uh, the malipeddi one which is which was done before optimization so there are some more results regarding our simulation and just to make sure the sinusoidal leading edge work better after the stall angle so you can see after 14 degree angle of attack it is performing better but before 14 degree it is it is uh, like performing pretty much similar so after install it is performing better and for this case we have done we have done the optimization after install which is 16 degree angle of attack so these are some uh, comparison between the optimized and before optimization and this is the lift uh, coefficient of pressure comparison coefficient of pressure is one of the most important thing based on which the lift pressure is uh, the lift force is generated and the coefficient of pressure it is like if you look into this this distance so higher this higher the difference of these two the higher the coefficient of lift will be the lift will be more and the performance will be better so if you see into the optimized one the red one the red one is on the top which shows that yes our result is correct so therefore you need to show the coefficient of pressure and also if you look into this the data the pressure data the negative pressure which is on the top here the negative pressure which is in the top the negative pressure is one, minus 1.06 
and here the negative pressure is minus 1.15 which is higher for the optimized case uh, compared to the baseline one and there are some velocity streamline and some of the key references that we used for our simulation yeah thank you so much lisa do you want me to go to the chat box and answer to the questions um thank you so much dr mahadi um i think there are uh, certain questions in here i'm not I'm, i haven't really um made sure if i heard them but just to make sure let's go over them um one was asking here if the table you showed earl earlier was for um hold on we'll go back to that it was about the table Rahi was asking what what was that table about um that was the question earlier and um I couldn't find a okay, question. So, uh, I think, yeah, this uh, this is the table that he was referring to. That was, um, okay. the, so, sorry, uh, supersonic, the, yeah. Okay, so this table is basically the summary of uh, previous published result, whatever they have done regarding the uh, regarding the leading as protuberances uh, by mimicking humpback whale for the application in aircraft wing. So in none of the literature, we just want to show they have improved the result but they haven't optimized the result. They haven't optimized the wing uh, and optimized the sinusoidal leading edge. So in our research, we have optimized the leading edge, optimized the sinusoidal leading edge. So we just want to show that people are doing work on that, but still there are some literature gap. So that's what we are planning to show here. I see. Um, he, was, he was also um, clarifying if it is for some sonic or a supersonic flow uh no no this is not for supersonic flow okay thank you i hope in, that in all of them in all of them the mac number is uh, way lower than one okay awesome thank you so much for clarifying that let me just double check um okay i have a question here from philemon mina um he says what is the objective when you make external domain and internal domain is that for mesh quality only or there is different there there is a different condition in each domain uh, okay so felimon uh, so the answer for your question no it's not for the mesh quality it's just to reduce the number of elements because our uh, area of interest uh, i did mention a couple of time our area of interest is the aerofoil so away from the aerofoil we don't bother too much that how the flow characteristic is showing. So we don't want very finer mesh away from the aerofoil. And if you make finer mesh in the entire domain, it will generate like more than 10 million of cells. And for uh, simulating 10 millions of cells, uh, it will like kill our two, three days minimum just to run one simulation for one second, uh, one second simulation. So just to reduce the just to reduce the number of elements and also the time, the computational time and computational cost, we make uh, three domains. You can make more than three if you want, and but you have to check the mesh sensitivity analysis. Yes, by making more domain, our result is changing or not. Okay, and here's another one from um, Andy. Um, he said that for clarity on the possible deliverables, um, would this lead to static structures that are implemented on the leading edge of an aircraft or a hydrodynamic wing? Uh, and... Okay. And, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Andy, just to answer your first part of the question, uh, those simulation was uh, done uh, in an aerodynamic, uh, aerodynamic environment, not in a hydrodynamic environment, but obviously, we are talking about the Reynolds number. So if we found anything like, let's say, uh, uh, you are getting, uh, you are talking about a uh, autonomous underwater vehicle. Uh, all right, so you are using an autonomous underwater vehicle, which is the case of hydrodynamic wing. Uh, and you are using, you are not using a flapping wing or a rotary wing, but you are using a, a static wing, and it runs on the same Reynolds number. 
which is 4.2 into 10 to the power 5. So it will still work on that hydrodynamic condition. But the simulation that we did, we did in a aerodynamic condition. But it's always in uh, mechanical engineering, it's always helpful to use the Reynolds number, the dimensionless number, so that you can move from the uh, you can move from the aerodynamic condition to hydrodynamic condition just by talk, but just by changing the density and kinematic viscosity and other steps and working on the same Reynolds number. Okay, um, thank you so much, and um, I hope that answers your question, Andy. And I think we have another um, question here. Um, Subsonic, supersonic, yeah, I think that's what he answered. Um, Kel, from Kelly's Warren, he said, why was it not optimized yet? Oh, so there is a question regarding software as well. Uh, the Minitab, uh, Minitab uh, is free for one month, Minitab software, uh, the optimization software, and the ANSYS, ANSYS is also free. There is a student version, and luckily, there was like a limitation of uh, number of elements which was half a million earlier, but in 2024, there is a good news for all the students. They have increased it like for 1 million, from half a million to 1 million, the number of element. So we can we can do a lot of simulation using the free version of the ANSYS. And another question, why was it not optimized yet? Thank you for your presentation. I don't know the answer. <laughs> no one has optimized it. It comes, comes in my mind to optimize it. So I am starting to optimize it. And my student did a great job. And we already submitted it in one of the good journal of fluid mechanics. And it's in under review. Hopefully, we'll get the published version soon. OK, thank you so much. Um, and from, from Yashwant, he is asking, um, how do we decide the size of domain and the area of interest? Uh, Yashwant, there is no thumbs rule for that. Every simulation is different. You have to play with your case, and you have to get the exact result. But the issue is that three condition. You have to maintain the Y plus value. You have to check the mesh sensitivity analysis by changing the domain by changing the size of the element your result doesn't change and you have to check your mesh quality if your skewness is more than 0.95 your mesh is not accepted so that's how you need to play with your sizing and you have to play with your domain size if you want to reduce time if and if you want to save time and reduce your domain but by reducing your domain size if the result changes the mesh sensitivity analysis changes then your domain is not acceptable. So that's how you have to play with your, by putting three target, uh, you have to play with your mesh and you have to play with your domain. Okay. And uh, I have one more from uh, jo Joss Pat. He says, um, response surface optimization is based on what? Uh, so we, 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 have, uh, we have two target that we want to optimize the uh, multi-objective we, we can we can tell it as a multi-objective that uh, we want to optimize the amplitude and we want to uh, optimize the wavelength and our target was to get a result of higher cl value and higher cl by cd value which is uh, correlated with the c so that's how we design our response surface all right um, thank you so much for that, Dr. Mahadi. Just double. Um, another one from Mohammed. Um, how long it can take for complete optimization? Mm, if you know, if you know the technique, and if you know the simulation, and if you are generating generating a medium scale wing, so it will not take more than one month, because uh, for running every simulation, it will take kind of one day. And you have to generate minimum 13 case, then the optimized case, and before that you have to do the validation. So if you are good with everything, one month sh should be enough to generate the result. But for implementing, it takes more time. All of my three students, all of my three master's students, they were more struggling with the writing. Uh, they, they were not struggling with the simulation and Minitab, but they are struggling with the writing and struggling with the generating or explaining the results. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much for
clarifying um, those, Dr. Mahadi, and um, I'm sure that our participants here um, really appreciate um, what you have shared um, today. And um, for those who are curious, um, the courses that cover, and um, for those who are curious, um, the courses that cover um, this topic would be our graduate certificate in mechanical engineering, graduate certificate in CAD and computational techniques, graduate diploma of engineering and mechanical, and our online master of engineering and mechanical as well. And um, let's move on. Um, a lot of people are now asking for the link to request a certificate, and I had already sent it in the chat. So please go ahead and um, submit your request. And for those who would like to know um, what our upcoming courses are um, that are related to this topic, you can go ahead and um, go to our website. Um, that's www.eit.edu.au and that's slash study um, dash areas slash mechanical dash uh, engineering. And you can see there that we have an advanced diploma of plant engineering coming up in March, on the 5th of March. And we also have professional certificate courses. Um, we have one that is focused on plant layout and piping design on the 12th of March. And um, we also have a professional certificate of competency in hydraulics and um, pneumatics that would start on the 19th of March and another professional certificate for the fundamentals of electric vehicles that would start in April and another advanced diploma of mechanical engineering technology still in April and a couple more professional certificate that would um, focus on chemical engineering and plant design and heating, ventilation, and air conditioning still in April and we have won a professional certificate um, that focuses on gas turbine engineering in May. And we also have our graduate diploma and graduate certificate for mechanical engineering that would start in June. So I hope that um, this helps you in choosing your courses. And for those um, who would like to attend the future webinars, you are free to do so. Um, these are our upcoming webinars, or you can go to our website and go to the events page, and that's www.eit.edu.au slash news dash events. And you can see our previous and upcoming webinars from there. And of course, for those who prefer to use the QR code in requesting for the certificate, you can go ahead and scan this code right here and for those who would like to use the link um, please go to the chat the link is in there i had sent it all right so we're done with our q and a and um, for those who would like to ask more questions feel free to send us an email to webinars at eit.edu.au. For those who have very specific um, questions about our courses, you can book a call with a course advisor. You can find that um, on our website. If it says book a call, you can go ahead and you can have a dedicated um, time that you can choose to be able to speak to a course advisor for your very specific questions. And of course, our website is www.eit.edu.au. We have our head office address here um, in Perth for those who are based in Australia and would like to visit. We also have our phone numbers listed in there for those who would be calling from outside of Australia and um, inside Australia. And again, thank you so much, everyone, for attending the webinar today. We are very happy that uh, we have you today. And we are also glad to share all these information. Hopefully, this could help you with your careers and in your uh, future decisions to study as well. Again, any questions that you have in mind later on, send an email to our webinars email. We really appreciate your um, attendance today. May everyone have a great day.